folks. Thanks for dropping in for another episode of Off the Record with Frankie. Today I chat with Mike Gribben, lead singer for Toronto-based rock band Bad Breed. Bad Breed released their latest album, entitled Bad Breed and Ferocious Love, today, Friday, July 17th. And they're doing something really cool. If you donate $25 or more to a charity of your choice and show the band your receipt, they will send you a vinyl pressing of both the new and their original album anywhere in the world for free. I just wanted to give that a shout out because I think it's a really cool cause. Anyway, Mike and I chat about a lot of things, uh, including the making of the new album, the reformation of Bad Breed after a very long hiatus, and our shared love for punk rock, and more specifically, our shared love for the Stooges. Anyway, I hope you enjoy listening as much as I enjoy talking to him. This boy looked and felt like love at the start. Oh, how was your uh, How was your Canada Day yesterday? I know we had to. We did a bit of a reschedule. Uh, what did you get up yeah. to? What did I get up to? I drove up north and picked up my daughter and her boyfriend from a cottage they were staying at and then drove back. So I basically spent the entire day sitting in a car. So oh. it was terrific. Yeah, no, it was fine, man. It was hot. And uh, no, it was nice. My daughter had two little tiny dogs. So those were in the car with us on the way home. And, you know, whatever. It was nice. Nice to see her. What did you do? I just had a nice picnic day with, uh, with the lady and uh, a close friend of hers. We just hung out in, in the park. Uh, it seemed to be what everyone in the city was doing. <laughs> it really did, yeah. Like, later in the evening, I was driving around the city, and, yeah, I was working. I was driving Uber at night, and, uh, yeah, everybody was either at a park or at a um, the beach, or they were at a patio. Yeah, people were out yesterday. They were out in force. So, yeah, it's ha- it was happening. Yeah. So you drive Uber. I was just listening to Kennedy's interview with you, and you mentioned that you yeah. drive for a living. So I was, I was going to yeah. ask, yeah, how's that going? How's, uh, how's dr- being an Uber driver during uh, quarantine? Uh, it's pretty crazy. Like, I mean, well, it's crazy is the wrong word. Um, during the actual, like, lockdown part, like mm-hmm. the first couple, whatever it was, like, because time... Time doesn't seem to mean what it used to anymore. Oh, but, I know. Um, yeah, the beginning of it was, like, really busy because it was weird because there was nobody, yeah, there was, like, nobody around doing things but people who worked at hospitals or grocery stores or long-term care facilities still needed rides to work and back. And at that point, like, I don't know if you were outside at all during that point, but, I mean, streetcars looked like ghost towns. There was nobody on them. So, you know, people were, re- like, were really afraid of using the public transit, at sea, or at least the people I was driving were. So um, it was interesting, like, getting to, like, during that first bit of the pandemic and talking to people who were working, like, doing frontline care and stuff, it was really interesting. And now it's kind of settled back to normal. Like, honestly, like, over the weekend, it's like, you know, you're picking up, uh, you know, three people who are going to a party or going, coming back. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a wide range of experience at this point. There's, you know, you kind of get the impression that a lot of people are kind of over everything and they're just like, they want normal life. Back. Yeah. Everybody wants it back, but they're kind of acting as if it's back. Right, and right. then there's some pretty cautious people. So, it's, you know, it's interesting. Speaking of uh, COVID, how did it affect Bad Breed? Were you guys planning on doing a bunch of shows or anything and then that all yeah. got put on hold? Yep. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, you know, all of the shows that we had lined up uh, were, you know, they were all canceled. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was a shame. And, you know, putting out a record during this particular time period is is interesting. Uh, well, is interesting the word. It's a weird time, uh, you know, but I think, I don't know. I mean, I, I like I know that, you know, having some extra time over the last couple of months, I've definitely checked out music that maybe I haven't before or Mm -hmm. gotten into some stuff or checked out stuff that I've been meaning to check out. So, you know, um, and, you know, I don't know, music is a great, can be a great distraction or send or or like something to uh, make you feel good or, you know, uh, any number of things during this. So, you know, um, yeah. So, yeah, we lost our live shows. We actually just saw each other, like myself and Maylin, who plays bass and sings, and Catherine, who plays synth and sings. We saw each other for the first time this past Sunday. Um, we kind of did, you know, uh, we filmed a couple of acoustic versions of some of our songs. We have some stuff to release on our social media before the album comes out in a couple of weeks. And so that was nice. Like, I really, I, like, beyond, like, I mean, as we discussed, I, I drive, right? So I have physically seen you know thousands of people since the pandemic started but i haven't actually spent time with friends so right. kinda, it was really nice it was cool so we got to do that and uh yeah 
happy that like it was just nice to see those guys. Right. Oh, well, that's nice. That's nice. Yeah, I did, I did see a post uh, that you guys had made on your socials uh, just about like first first hang in a long time. Oh, my God. Yeah. So first hang in months because we actually played. So we played a show uh, March the 8th, was the, which was the Saturday night before. That was the last Saturday before everything got locked down. And we I mean, that, you know, we just I, I like at that point, you know, um, the the coronavirus was a thing that I just heard about on the radio where you're like, oh, that sounds really hard in mm-hmm. China. You know what I yeah. mean? It sounds oh, like yeah. they're having a really rough time. Meanwhile, you know, that Saturday night we're playing, we're doing, you know, whatever. We had a great show. We were all excited about what we were doing next. And days later, uh, reality set in. And that's, <laughs> so, I mean, having said that, you know, we, we did hang out. We are shooting, like we've got our first video um, for our first single, which is called War With Myself. It's coming out. It's actually being, um, it's going to be premiered on Friday, which is, I don't know when this will be aired, but Friday, mm-hmm. the 3rd of July, mm-hmm. uh, Exclaim Exclaim Magazine is going to premiere it for us, oh, which wicked. is great. Yeah, so we're really excited about that. I think it's really cool. I'm really happy that they were that they offered to do that so and then it'll be on our all of our social media like our youtube channel with about 24 hours after that so yeah so luckily we had that in the can we had shot in um january we shot a video for the first single and uh which i'm really happy with and then we are in about two two weeks tomorrow we're going to shoot a video um for the second single which is called make me prove it so we you know um with you know of course not going to be a huge production, you know. It'll be a, it, it'll be a small affair because that's the way thing you got to do things right now. So, oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, so we we have things happening. We are, you know, we are uh, we are moving along, but uh, different than before. Yeah, yeah. Well, tell me about the uh, the video coming out. Uh, well, tomorrow, I suppose. Well, this is going to be coming out and <laughs> not tomorrow. So on uh, right. July third, so, run me through the video. <laughs> yeah. So the video. Um, was um, was directed by our friend. Well, guy, I you know a person I, I just met. I have a friend um, uh, named Glenn Glenn Davis, who's a, like he's a cinematographer, and he you know he works on all whatever. It's, I think I think he makes a lot of his living working on shows for like Netflix and stuff, and mm-hmm. you know that's and so. You know, I was just saying, yeah, I'd love to do a video with you sometime. Anyways, he's, he's got a friend named got, who is a director named Michael Medic, and so they got a small crew together, and we filmed in um, late January at the rehearsal space slash living space of our live drummer. Our live drummer's name is Mark Hundavad. Um, you know, he comes and does, like on the record, he plays vibes, he plays percussion, he plays organ. He's a multi-instrumentalist, but he's a great drummer as well. Okay. And he lives in a great spot, kind of in the um, in the Parkdale area. And he's, he, you know, he can live and rehearse. Like, his, he's got an insane schedule. He essentially, I think he starts his days at usually about 5 or 6 p.m. And then he practices, you know, he practices all night long. And during lockdown, he was just kind of practicing you know, eight, nine hours a day. So he's got this wild little spot that you can, you know, that we came in and used. We dressed it up and it's essentially a live video. Um, Catherine, again, one of the, one of our four vocalists set up some choreography and there's there's some cool moves that the women of the band do. Uh, And I really like it. It's got a lot of energy. And so, yeah, essentially it's a live clip for, like I said, for War With Myself. And uh, yeah, I'm excited about it. I'm happy with it. Cool. Oh, yeah, that sounds that sounds like a lot of fun. Well, yeah, I mean, this yeah, would be a good segue to, to talk about the new album. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 the new album. I'm really, really happy about that as well. I'm yeah, really excited about it. I've had a chance to listen to it, man. There's, uh, yeah, it's it's great. There's It's definitely, like, super powerful. Um, when I read more about, uh, like, in the, in the press release that I received, when I read more about what it was about... Um, and the the journey the the journey that it kind of takes you on, yeah. um, it's uh, it made it all all the more powerful. But uh, I was really impressed with like the wide range of genres you're hearing and the mix like the mashups of genres too. You're, there's like there's a lot going on. So I did want to ask you if anyone asked what kind of genre you see yourself in, what would you say to that? Well, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the the band when it started years ago, like there was a, a different lineup of this band back in 
you know, 2014, 2015, when we did our first record. Mm -hmm. And I would say at the time, at that time, it was really easy. Like, it was four guys playing, like, rock slash punk rock music. You know what I mean? Um, it was a lot faster it was a lot more aggressive mm -hmm. uh, fast forward to 2018 suddenly it's not four guys anymore suddenly it's you know three women and a couple of guys and you know completely different lineup and people from all different like not just musical tastes but just different walks of life mm -hmm. you know what i mean with diff completely different experience everybody had their foot in music at one time or another but um net like i mean i think the something super cool for me and exciting because uh, really what it is more than anything and this is I will <laughs> I will try to define what genre we are at some point but like <laughs> you know it's really what it is is it's a it's a it's a, it's a, it's a collective mm -hmm. and it is a collaborative collective right, right. so um, when when I thought to myself I had taken a break from music for a few years I was dealing with a lot of uh, like I was basically just if life wasn't going great for me like it does not you know like many people have periods of times where things are not going well so i was dealing with a, lots of mental health issues and you know um maybe some other artists or musicians can relate to this you, you know if you're not if things aren't feeling great you know sometimes you you, you, you tell yourself well that's it i'm never going to play again i'm never going to sing again i'm never going to you know do any of that stuff mm -hmm. coming out of that um and being able to connect with all of the people who made this record possible and who like truly did like dig in and collaborate and, uh, you know, you know, work, work with me on this. Um, we suddenly it's like no longer, it's not a rock band. So to answer your question, it's like, really, we, we're, we're, we're very different. Like a lot of us and, and basically none, nobody with the exception of myself and the guitar player, Oscar had actually played like in a, traditional quote rock band before, mm -hmm. right like may lynn came here from cuba in the early 2000s and you know she plays you know she had come from she was a musician mm -hmm. and an actor and a teacher and a million other things like she's the busiest person i know so she came here and you know she and i played in a short-lived project together that was trying to fuse like cuban music and kind of rock music back in the early 2000s so i, I got back in touch with her so you've got that person um catherine uh is you know really she's a trained singer she did lots of musical theater and stuff like that her other project that she works on is you know, largely uh, has lots of elements of like folk and I think some Celtic stuff. Uh, so, and then Mark, the dr the um, vibes player, is a jazz guy. Like he lives in the jazz world. Mm -hmm. uh, so then you put all that together, and a lot of the things that you know, the stuff that we do have in common is like soul music, right. R and B, uh, and funk and stuff like that. So right. I think that's you know to to take a hopefully you were probably asking for a, a sound bite but you know I think we're kind of like a I think we lean heavily on funk R and R and B and and soul and then there are there are definitely elements of rock in there as well for sure and yeah don't don't apologize this is totally fine <laughs> I'm good to talk right. as long as you're good to talk don't worry <laughs> oh yeah I'm, I'm here man. <laughs> okay yeah cool well tell me about you know you, you so you mentioned you you took a break from music um did, yeah. and then what what brought you back into it well i mean so yeah like i mean the, the reality of the situation is that yeah i took a break for a number of years so from 2015 until 2018 i didn't do anything basically and i had um my partner my wife who i'd been with since i was 15 years old uh, died at the end of 2017 and she had, after a long battle with mental illness you know where we were both kind of suffering together at the same time in the same household and um, the best way I can describe it is again you know there was there's nothing you know things could have gone any number of ways for me at that point mm -hmm. um, but it was just the most sobering if, of course you know what can be more sobering than that right like literally um that shock of that and the the everything that that you know that 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 was and that that meant at the time uh really instead of instead of doing what it you know what it may have like you know put me to put me in bed for the next year or something mm -hmm. it woke me up and shook me out of it and um you know and again, it's not like a silver lining or anything like that. I think that would be the wrong, the wrong way to look at it. But it was just, it just shook my life up so hard. Like the, the best, I mean, it was like the biggest slap in the face, punch in the face, whatever, however 
however you want to describe it. And suddenly I was faced with being a single parent, right? Suddenly right. I'm, I'm a single parent. I've got a 17 year old, uh, that, you know, I'm it. Right. So yep. part yep. of, and so then I look around and I had been very, very, very like, you know, really like a hermit for a few years. I didn't see people. I didn't talk to people. Uh, I just was living in this, this alternate reality that was, you know, pretty you know, dark and it was an unhappy place a lot of the time. And so I sought human contact for the first time in years. Like once again, you know, it, it, this is, I mean, this didn't all happen at once. It wasn't a lightning bolt, but it slowly, I kind of shook off, you know, and stood up from where I had been. And I realized that one of the things that, that I immediately felt like, you know, I was starving for was to start to make music again. And, um, and I reached out to Catherine first and I just said, listen, I've got an idea for a song. I was wondering if you would help me write it because I don't play, I don't play piano. I don't play guitar. Uh, I write lyrics and I think of melodies in my head and kind of hum them into my phone. Right. Right. So right. There's, there's where I, might, I have some definite limitations. So I, that's why it's everything I do, even if I have an, an incredibly like clear picture of how I think a song should be in my head, mm -hmm. you know, if I can't actually, you know, once you start humming that to somebody, uh, it, it'll take a different life on, right? Is, right? You know, I might not even be humming in the right key or, you know, whatever it is. So suddenly now this, this it's true, it's collaborative in that, in that uh, way. So all these people were so kind and, you know, Maylin, Catherine, Oscar, like everybody in the band, um, you know, when I reached out to them and, and again, I really hadn't been in contact with them for a couple of years. And I said, hey, guys, like, it would be really helpful for me if I could get some help. And you know, if I could get, it would be helpful for help. It would be helpful mm -hmm. for me if I could get some help writing songs. And I didn't want to burden one person with eight songs. Do you know what I mean? Gotcha. I kind of thought, like, no, I, I can't take all the time of this human being. So I, you know, I reached out to Catherine and I had the idea for the song As Promised. Right, which right. is Catherine's a great piano player, keyboard player, so that made sense to write on piano. I had the idea for the song Animal Impact, um, which is like kind of a more like it's got a, it's a more groove based with a riff, you know, kind of more akin to like the way that Led Zeppelin presented like funk and stuff like that. Uh, so I went to May Lynn because May Lynn's a, you know a bass player. She's you know she makes up she's just a funky player, right? Mm -hmm. So. And then something, and then I realized like, oh, it'd be great if we had this person and this person. Anyways, eventually I just, I, it became clear. It's like, well, this, we've got enough songs for an album. It's like, this can be a band. And I picked up playing drums again. I had, I had quit playing the drums like many years ago. Again, like all like sort of like anxiety based reasoning, like, oh, you, you know, the things that people tell themselves, I'm not good at this, whatever it is. Yeah. So I, I forced myself to pick them up again, pick up the, them being the drumsticks. And I started, I started rehearsing with these guys, not like not thinking I'd be the drummer, but I ended up playing drums on the album, and it was so satisfying. So, to make a long story short, which is, I mean, it's a, it's an incredibly long story, but you know, I just relied on the kindness and the generosity of time of all these really, really cool people. Right, right. Well, man, that's thanks, thanks for sharing that. That's uh, and big up to you for managing to, you know do the best possible way of, of overcoming something so tragic and just coming out of like, you know, having, having been someone that's struggled with, um, with mental health as well. I, I know that's the hardest thing is one reaching out to people. Um, yeah. and also just believing in yourself enough to be, you know, to be like, no, I can, I can do this. I can like get out of this, this funk out of this, like the black hole. And, uh, yeah. Good for you, man. That is that is. Well, I mean, it's, so if you've had any experience with it at all, and I'm sorry if you've had to, to deal with that, because you know, I guess you and I can both we can both agree that it is difficult. Yeah. Right. And when and yeah, and it is truly a hole, and and um, yeah, and I and I I, I don't want to make it trite and just say like one day I, everything was bad and then the next day everything was good. Yeah. It was absolutely a it was a struggle. However, there was a catalyst which was. A tra like it was a tragedy, right? Like a, yeah. for me, for myself and my family, this tragic event happened. And I think, you know, with when that happens, I think had I just folded up and never emerged from my bed again, I think some, you know people would say yeah, that's a reasonable response <laughs> to this happening. Yeah, but uh, it didn't, and mm -hmm. I'm lucky. Like I am lucky that that's not what happened, and I am lucky that I had. 
you know, I'm, I don't want to call them a support system, but it really was, you know. I, oh, absolutely. Like, to have all these, again, like just, yeah, because you, again, when you're, when you're really, when you don't feel good and you don't talk to people for a while, you convince yourself, or at least I do, that like, I'm not going to reach out to them because, man, I haven't talked to them for a year and a half or two years. They don't want to talk to me. You know, like yeah. you can tell yourself anything, right? Oh, it's I, so I, easy I to do that too. To that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's okay. so easy to, like, yeah. you're your own worst enemy when you're, when you're in that headspace. Oh, you're your only enemy. Like, you know what I mean? You're, <laughs> and that's exactly and that's it, what, yeah. Like, I mean, not, not to be, take things literally, but the first song, and I knew it had to be the first song on the record, and it's the first single, it's called War With Myself, and mm -hmm. like, really, I, mean, I think that says it all, right? Yes. That's about depression. That's about literally, like, you know, going to war with yourself, and, uh, and that, I don't know. And, it, and, you know, and we structured that song specifically so that it kind of comes around at the end and lifts up. It goes in a crescendo and the lyric is, at the end is now I'm rhythm bound. And so that was, and, and you know, I, mean, I don't want to sound cheesy, but it's like rhythm bound is, you know, um, you know, is Carl Perkins, right? Like right. old rock and roll guy. And, uh, but to me, that was just like, I went to war with myself and now I'm rhythm bound. And it's like, I'm, like thanks to music in this particular case, um, you know, I, I have another path. You oh. know what I mean? I have. Yeah. There's a, there's a third way, right? Definitely. So, uh, that, uh, yeah. Definitely, man. That's that's yeah. That's so strong and powerful. That's awesome. So. With with all of that in mind, is does that make a big difference between this album and and the last one with the the message that you're that you're trying to say in your songs and a huge difference, a, a huge difference. The first record, when I think of the first record, I mean, let's even go with the title. The first record is called "The Violent World of Bad Breed." Yeah, that was me like punching around. You know what I mean? Like instead of war with myself. Um, the, fr the first track on that is called Looking for War. And the lyric is, I wake up looking for war. I go to bed feeling the same way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it was that was a, an album written and mixed and produced and performed in the, you know, at the beginning of a really bad period of depression. Right. Right? So, and I don't think I knew what I was writing. Like, you know, I've always, I've written songs since I was about 12, right? right. And, you know, and it's been a long journey, like from, you know, uh, uh, and... So that record, I mean, yeah, I don't know that there was a message other than it's like, I, if you can take anything out of that first, first record, it's like, I'm listening to a person who is in distress. You right. know what I mean? Like that's and I angry, that, probably. That, that sums that up. This one is called, you know, instead of the violent world of bad breed, this bad breed, this is called the bad breed in ferocious love. So it was not only written after a, this, you know, period of like intense uh, personal issues and, and, and the things, you know, th those things that I, I personally went through, but I also at the, it was also written at the beginning of falling in love again, right. you know, and, um, and so, yeah, like this time, I don't think I wrote it with like, I, it's not like the who, I didn't write like a rock opera or something like that, but, um, you know, it was definitely, I, it is, the record is put in a sequence of, of songs uh, that charts from being at war with yourself to, you know, going through this, finding this new relationship and, you know, tr hopefully ma learning from some mistakes that you've made and the, the ferocious power of love and how also that was between the music and, and finding somebody, you know, that I, you know, just am crazy about and, you know, was able to help me so much in terms of being supportive and knowing where I was coming from and stuff. I mean, it's, it's for me, the record is, uh, is like a transformative statement in eight songs, right? So, right. Yeah. yeah. And it, it definitely comes across. I, I think uh, when people get, finally get their hands on this and can listen to the record front to back, they'll, they'll see that too. I definitely felt that. I hope so. Uh, I, I always yeah. I always try to do that when uh, whenever I receive a press kit and I'm about to interview someone usually comes along with a new album coming out. Right. So uh, yeah. I always before reading the write up, I'll try and listen to the album first and kind of make my own mind okay. up about how I feel, how I feel about one, the album, but also, uh, you know, just the songwriting. And I'm, I'm a lyric. I'm a lyrics person. So I always listen to the words and like, yeah, and like I could definitely tell like, oh, we're, we're going on a journey here. Like this, this is like started off pretty dark and now it's, it's ending like, oh, this is the, like, there's hope. <laughs> there's hope at the end yeah. of the, at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Yeah. And again, 
again, like I hope, like I'm, like I hope, I, uh, well, I'm glad that, like, first of all, thank you just for listening to it. Like, I mean, I'm just thrilled for anybody, like, for, I'm thrilled that you sat and took time and, and, like, listened to this thing that we spent so much time and means so much to us. So thank you. Oh, and, of course. um, yeah, like, you know, when we sat down, we had those eight songs, you know, it was like, well, for me, you know, I always picture things with vinyl in mind, right? Mm -hmm. I, you know, with my projects that I have put out before, I put them out on, you know, usually a very limited run, right? And this is no exception. I'm going to, like, right now, as we speak, at some factory somewhere in Quebec, a hundred copies of this record is being pressed, right? right? So I picture things in terms of how does side one start, how does side one end, because that's how I grew up consuming music, right? Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's important, um, you know, and not every record tells a story. Like, my, you know, I mean, do you know Fun House by the Stooges? I don't know if you know that album. I love that album. I love that album as well. And I love the sequencing of the records. And I know that those, I mean, I, what's the message on that one? I don't know. We're crazy motherfuckers or whatever it is, right? <laughs> we like, love you know, heroin. We're, we're out of control. <laughs> yeah. and we're amazing. Whatever it is, I love the way that that's sequence. I love the way Raw Power is sequenced, you know, mm -hmm. by the Stooges as well. Or any number of records, and some aren't the same, right? But yeah. for me, that's that's important. So I pictured it always from how will this, when I put a needle down, which I know only a hundred people will, uh, you know, but you know, if you were to put a needle down on this record, how does it start? Does it jump out of the speakers? And that's how I thought, and that's why I was like, War With Myself has to start, because it's the kind of, it's got the most adrenaline. Right. And then you, I'd like it to end with not in my life, which is kind of a, it's like a mission statement of as best as I can, I'm not going to go back to that place anymore. I'm not going to have that kind of pain again, or at least, you know, that, that is my, that is my <laughs> hope and my, my mission at this point. Right. So, yeah. That's cool. I, I, I really admire that doing, uh, just doing it old school and, um, you know, I've, started collecting uh, vinyl myself probably in the last five years and if you go back like I, I love my favorite thing uh was going into record stores going in the discount bin and just finding yep. weird and wonderful records bands i haven't heard of oh this 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 album looks cool this is a fun title and going home and listening to yep. it and you can really tell I, back in the day that's just ahead. how it was right i did i mean i, I it sounds like you know i have a few things in common i uh absolutely have spent like countless hours doing that you yeah. know it's my my daughter spent a number of years in in taekwondo right so she was at training sometimes like four or five days a week but her she was at um a place that right across the street had a, a great used record store so when she would go in to train i would go over to that store and just you know just spend hours and hours and hours same thing like you know oh my god that cover is crazy i don't know what this is mm -hmm. I, at that time i didn't have an iphone where i could look it up and find out what the star rating was right you know, yeah whatever it was right <laughs> so yeah you're definitely taking your chances a lot of the time when you're For doing sure. that but it can yield some some pretty awesome results do you mind if i quickly mention something uh, with regards to the vinyl that i just I, it is actually important to me um like i said we are making uh 100 copies we're actually not selling them and I just want anybody listening to be aware of this. If you're interested in this, what we're doing instead is with a $25 donation to any charity that is important to you, $25 or more, it's not limited to that, mm -hmm. uh, during this time, because as we know, I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're in the middle of like a social upheaval and rebellion. So there's everything from, you know, any kind of charities, food banks, Black Lives Matter, any number of things, whatever is important to you. If you... Um, We'll give something in the neighborhood of $25 or up to any charity, and then you send us a copy of the receipt, like just, you know, a screenshot or whatever. I will ship you a copy of this album and our first record uh, anywhere in the world at no cost to you. Wow, so man. I just would like to do that as encouragement for people. Just because there's, so, I mean, you know, uh, I know it's not a lot. I mean, it's a record, right? But, I mean, it's, if, it's a, if it's a little bit of encouragement, uh, I just know there's so many places uh, that I've volunteered at or just in general that are, are hurting right now. So that's what we'd like to do with our, with our actual physical copies of this album. That's awesome, Mike. That's really cool. I, I did see that and that was actually something I was going to bring up. So I'm glad you did. Um, oh, okay, cool. Okay, that, cool. That's Thanks. awesome, man. I, I, uh, I, I really, I admire that too. That's just such a, it's such a good thing. I think like right now, you know, with, with COVID, with like just also the, you know, the, 
Black Lives Matter stuff happening and just like there's just so much shit. <laughs> there's so much shit going on in the world right now and community is so important and that's that's really great. I, that's really great. I agree and there's just I mean and it's just again I you know you may be like me. I mean I wake up and there are emails from different you know this this food bank or this child care center or this you know people are being places are being stretched thin as mm -hmm. we're as you know like I mean jobs are being lost the economy is not great and charitable organizations uh at the best of times you know they all i mean by nature they require and they live on people's generosity right yeah. so if we can encourage uh, a little bit of that then awesome like hooray you know like that's 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 cool someone has like no idea what to um donate to is there anything that you would uh you would say like i don't know just top of mind well, yeah, I mean, we're, we, would we would encourage right now, and I'm just going to say this, like, as a group, um, you know, we're, at, like, right now with what, I mean, since the killing of George Floyd a few weeks ago mm -hmm. and, in, and the beginning of this, you know, reckoning with racism against not only black people but black trans people and indigenous people and just people of color, um, we're at a moment where, you know, it really feels... I think to a lot of people, like there could be substantive change if the will continues to be there and if people continue to push and those organizations, and by those, I mean Black Lives Matter, there's Black Mental Health uh, Matters, Toronto, there are charities like that that just, with, with additional help and with additional enthusiasm, what, who knows what the possibilities are. Yeah. Right? And then beyond that, on a local level, I mean, I, I, you know, right now, because I drive Uber and I'm exposed to so many people, I'm not doing the, the stuff that I was doing for charity before. Um, but I was at um, the Young Street Mission, uh, which has a food bank that operates four days a week. So, I mean, and those guys, you know, and that, like, I have loved my time there. I was there for the last year. And so Young Street Mission in Toronto, if you'd like something very local and, you know, Otherwise, like what uh, to me, all I'm saying to you, the the person who may want our our album or maybe into this whole idea, uh, what's near and dear to your heart, right? What's important to you? Right. Well, man, again, that's just a, an awesome cause and such a great um, such a great thing to to offer up. So I, I thank you for that. I'll definitely be uh, sending you a receipt for sure. I've uh, I've awesome. been I've been donating where I can. So um, I'll awesome. I'll be grabbing one of those. Man, listen, I know times are tough. People like particularly people like in the arts and stuff like that. You know, you're losing your gigs, you're losing your et cetera, et cetera. So, so yeah, but that's cool, man. I appreciate that. Speaking of uh, just going back to the album again, what? Uh, how long ha have you been working on this? How long? It sounds like it's been a project, right? Like uh, you're working with it different had, people. Yeah. So we we started. I, I was looking back at my kind of like recordings, you know, because again, mm -hmm. like everything we were doing as we were starting, I went to Catherine's apartment. Um, back in May, or eight, pardon me, April of 2018. So that's two years ago. Two right? years. So that was just sitting down and saying, hey, I have this idea for this song, and I don't really know how it could go, how it should go, but can you please help me? Which is usually my thing. I'm always, you know, like, hey, would you mind helping me with this? Because I don't exactly know, you know. So, uh, you know, um, so yeah, at, at April, and now where are we at? Like, the album officially comes out, um, July 17th, so two weeks, well, <laughs> for, I don't know when you're listening to this, but anyway, so till Friday, July 17th, our record comes out, so it's right. long. We recorded at two different studios, we did one session where we recorded half the record at a place called Palace Sound with our friend um, Andrew Gunn, who actually used to, uh, do you know, do you remember the band The Deadly Snakes? Yes, yeah, I do. Okay, so, yeah, so D Andrew was the drummer for that band, he started that band, and he used to be in my old, like, kind of, like, a very aggressive punk rock band called The Killer Elite, that was sort of like a late 90s Toronto, uh, uh, very Stooges-inspired, as far as the, the way that things were on stage and stuff like that. Cool. So we recorded at his studio, like, my old friend opened a studio, we recorded half there, and then we moved to a place called South River Sound with our friend, um... Michael Delaro, whose nickname is Mez, he recorded the other half, and I loved working with Mez. We had a great relationship, so I, uh, uh, he and I, and sometimes Catherine, uh, spent many hours uh, mixing and uh, getting that album ready. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a long journey. That's awesome. That's awesome, man. Well, Mike, let's. Um, I also did want to did want to know about you know Mike Grimm, the person. 
Um, tell me about uh, tell me about you and and music. I do know from the the interview you did with uh, Kennedy what you know the first couple of like records you kind of grew up listening to on repeat just because you had nothing else and all of that. But yeah. let's let's go into that a bit more. Yeah, I mean, again, like yeah, like that. Really, I did not grow up in what you would consider a musical household. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, my dad. Uh, my dad was born in Scotland and, and moved here, and he grew up listening to, like, 50s rock and roll, right? So okay. he would, but he didn't listen to it. This was the thing. He would sing it all the time. So he was constantly singing, like, help me, Rhonda, help, help me, Rhonda. And my sisters and I would be sitting in the car with our fingers in our ears going, like, stop singing. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so I, I mean, I knew a lot of these songs because he wouldn't shut up about it, right? <laughs> right. So my mom, I never saw her pick up a... Turn, like I didn't I don't think to be completely honest she had any interest in in music she read books a lot she didn't you know so we had you know we had a record player and we had some classical albums and then again we had like Puff the Magic Dragon by the Irish Rovers and we mm -hmm. had a Don McLean album that had Bye Bye Miss American Pie that was it I knew those two songs right and um so and then again you know you go to school you start meeting people you realize that oh there's not just the Irish Rovers and Don McLean like suddenly <laughs> Right, right. So I actually, do you remember, I, you're probably a lot younger than me, they had this thing called the, the, Colette, the Columbia Record and Tape Club, where you got a flyer in the newspaper, and you the deal was you send them a penny, and they will send you 11 cassettes, but then you're on the hook for buying one cassette a month for a year at regular price. Anyways, I convinced my mom to let me pay a penny to get 11 cassettes. I didn't know what any of the groups were, mm -hmm. so there was a band called The Police. I thought that sounded cool. So I took every album they had, right? So cool. suddenly I got like this package that had David Bowie, Let's Dance, plus every Police album. So as a young Wicked. person, that's why I picked up the drums. I was listening to this. And I was so cat, like I was just like, oh, okay, I, this this isn't like Puff the Magic Dragon. This is great. I didn't know what they were talking about. I didn't right know what on. they were doing. But, you know, I asked my mom uh, when I was 11 if I could start playing the drums. So I was given that Christmas a snare drum that had a little weird L-shaped um, stand that was attached to the snare drum that had a tiny splash symbol. So I had a pair of sticks and that. And that was where my, my you know, journey into music began. It was like truly with, you know, two songs that were just the only songs I knew. And then out of sheer embarrassment, I uh, bought some cassettes. And, and after that, you know, and then I got a radio and then I heard Led Zeppelin. And that was it. And I was like, well, I think this is what I'd like to, to do if right. I can, you know. Do you remember when the, the punk rock influence came in? 100%, yeah, when I met. So my first wife, Deb, um, I met her when I was 15 years old, and she was into all this, you know, I, like we ended up talking, we worked at a place like a factory where we like collated newspapers together. Wow. You'd get there at 6 p.m., and you'd work till 6 a.m., and you'd come out and you'd be coughing up ink. Like it was... <laughs> gross and hot and just like whatever it was a job right yeah. so it was yeah. cool but you'd stand for 12 hours talking to whoever was beside you and i met this slightly older girl when i was 15 and you know she was wearing like patches of like husker do and you know starting to talk to me about the sex pistols and i was like i, I don't know what she's talking about you know what? i mean i yeah. heard of um, i just didn't know what it was right you know what i mean so this is like 19 87 type thing and so she literally she the next week at work she'd show up with a bag that had records in it and suddenly i'm listening to the dead kennedys and i'm listening to the sex pistols and i'm you know and, and the you know but the, the thing that got me was the stooges like, yeah i like that i made perfect sense because it was close enough to rock do you know what i mean like they yep. never went super fast they weren't playing hardcore um but it was so exciting and so visceral. Yeah. And of course, I'd never seen what they looked like playing live. I didn't know they were like, I didn't know Iggy Pop was like a crazy front man or anything. I just liked their songs. Right, know? right, right, right. And yeah, so that really did it for me. And then I met um, my friend Jim, who we had our, our first punk rock band together when we were in high school. Uh, and he was the kid at school who, you know, we were both very quiet. I, you know, we didn't know each other, but he had safety pins all over his jacket and dead Kennedy stuff, you know. We ended up, I said, I play drums, he played guitar, and then he showed me his collection of records, which is The Clash, and, you know, he knew, you know, his sister dated a singer in a Toronto punk rock band, um, 
you know, so we, uh, you know, so it was called random killing. So, you know, like he knew, you know, he, whatever. He just had, I met people who had records, you know, that's how right. it was. Right. And uh, I, I was captivated by it and it made a lot of sense. And so, yeah, I started my first like punk rock band with him. I played drums and sang. He played guitar and sang. His uh, cousin played bass. And um, yeah, that's how we started. That's wicked. Do you remember the first uh, show you went to? The first, like, punk show that I went to? Yeah. Yeah, I do, because, in, so I grew up in Pickering. Okay. And they used to do this thing on Sundays, and I think it was one Sunday a month, like, I can be, somebody will correct me on this, Jim will correct me on this, and they would hold it at, like, um, like, you know, uh, community centers, right? So, it was a free event, you'd come, and, you know, local bands would play, and, you know, some people would have fanzines, and that kind of stuff, right? right like, right. that old style scene. And I think the first time that I went to it, I walked in, and I was very nervous because I didn't know anybody. You know, we had heard we, they, there were flyers up in our area. So I went, and there was a metal band playing, and I leaned against the back wall, and all the lights went out in the building. <laughs> and I realized I had shut them all off. Like, I had leaned against all the fucking light switch, switches. So I was mortified. I turned them all back on, and everybody, like, you know, I was just trying to be out of the way and quiet and shy. And right. suddenly everybody's like, who turned off those lights? So anyways, that was, you know, and then so I saw... But, but then I saw like a thrash band and I saw uh, punk rock bands play and um, yeah, it was thrilling and it was exciting. It was so different than seeing like the regular kind of rock shows that I, that I had kind of, you know, been used to seeing. Like I'd seen like Pink Floyd in the 80s and stuff, and which is a million years away from like a, a community center full of kids, you know? Definitely, yeah. <laughs> Wow, that's that's really cool. And then when did the uh, I noticed in in uh, some of your photos and stuff that you're uh, you're pretty covered in ink. When did that start happening? <laughs> that started in my early twenties. I got one tattoo that like so are you, like you, if you know the Stooges, I'm assuming you know the MC5. Hell yeah, yep. Yeah, so because I was very very into that like Stooges MC5 like that Detroit like tough sounding hard rock punk rock stuff mm -hmm. and so they they had a symbol that was kind of the black panther panther but with wings on it yep. uh, and so I got <laughs> that tattooed on my arm when I was 21 and uh, you know and then I was like well that's enough and then of course it's never enough so no. now now I barely now there's not very much room left right. but yeah anyway <laughs> so uh, yeah but I, it started with the MC5 and went from there Wow, man, that's cool. That's yeah. cool. That's also yeah. kind of like full circle because I know MC5 really, uh, they help make the Stooges a, a thing. Without MC5, the Stooges may have not ever happened. Yeah, well, that, I mean, like, I guess um, Danny, whatever his name was, the, the A&R guy um, for whatever the record company was. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not being very articulate. Anyways, the, a guy came to see the MC5 play to sign to... Uh, Electra Records yeah. and the Stooges were opening, so he signed both. Right? Yeah, so exactly. A story where he, you know where he called in and said, you know, there's a, there's this other band here that's great too, and you know whatever the story. The record label was like, okay, offer the, the the great band X amount of dollars, and, that, and offer the you know the other band X amount. You know, so anyway, yeah. they signed them to some <laughs> great deal, and yeah, yeah, the Stooges. Um, you know, I that's. You know, uh, yeah, I, don't, I can't really say enough about how influential they were, uh, just musically, and then of course learning how, and again, like just that aggressive, uh, like, you know, kind of being almost at odds with the audience sometimes, Yeah, that was very influential with me as well in my early 20s and mid-20s, when because again, I had started as a drummer, a singing drummer, and I kind of patterned myself at, um, after... Grant Hart, who was the drummer for Husker Du, like from Minneapolis, which cool. was a power trio that I loved growing up, power trio punk rock band. And then suddenly I stopped playing drums and I thought like I'm gonna, you know, so I actually started a Stooges cover band. And, um, you know, with about, a, with 10 other people, it was ridiculous. I mean, it was like oh a million God. guitars and it was, it was too much. Anyway, <laughs> that turned into a very Stooges inspired band called The Killer Elite, which I, you know, which then eventually myself and the drummer formed Bad Breed together, right? And, right. sorry, and yeah, anyway, there's a lot of crossover there. So, uh, yeah, man, that was just, and so, yeah, with that band was very, you know, that was a drunken bunch of idiots challenging the audience to fight all the time. So, yeah. you know, very different from, from today, but yeah, from right. doing now, but yeah. How did you, uh, uh, how did you get to the name Bad Breed, by the way? Pardon me? How did you get to the name Bad Breed? 
Well, it's pretty simple. First of all, I think it sounds cool, and second yeah. of all, I'm um, I'm very into. I don't want to. I, I have to be very specific with this. I used to work in professional wrestling as uh, a. Um, as a referee, right? So I did cool. not like, I mean, I did not work for like the WWE or any of that stuff, but I did, it's more like local or some of the Northeastern United States and stuff like that. I was big into certain types of pro wrestling. And there was a tag team in the nineties called the bad breed. And I just thought that was a cool name. So I borrowed it from them. Wicked. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's so, that, that's such a random, uh, random little fact there, a little tidbit. Yeah. When, how did you get well, into I mean, wrestling? Yeah, the band before that I had with, with May Lynn, like from Bad Breed was called Burning, and same thing, there was a there was a team from Japan that I really liked called Burning, and I, you know, nobody else had that name for a band, so I was like, no, nah, that's what we're going to be that's called. That's what so, we're called. Yes, it might sound like I'm obsessive about it, but it's just something, like for as long as I've been interested in punk rock or rock, and, you know, music, doing music, I've also, you know, I'm not very, I'm not up on it today, but for a period of time, I was very, very into and influenced by some aspects of professional wrestling, the, wow. kind of, the showmanship of it, yeah. That's cool, and w when did you start refereeing that? Uh, I started refereeing about eight years ago, Okay. and um, you know, so I, I did that for about six years, I just stopped, I stopped about a year and a half ago because um, there was a lot of travel involved uh, right. to the U.S., and it was kind of starting to take every weekend up, and then I was starting to really getting into writing the record, right. and I kind of just made a decision that, you know, uh, I was going to devote my time to, do this, to doing this, because I was kind of being asked, you know, to do one or the other, like by the wrestling guys, I was being sort of told, like, you know, you kind of have to make a decision here, where do you want to, where are you spending your time, and I was like, I think I'm going to write a record, so. Right, yeah. right, interesting. Yeah. How does uh, refing that work? Because isn't it all kind of like premeditated? Well, <laughs> things have changed over the years. Um, what it used to be, I mean, it started out in the early 1900s as a legitimate sport, right? To the point where matches could last for hours, right. like hours. You know <laughs> what I mean? There were guys in the in the you know at the turn of the last century who would fill stadiums and they just watch these guys grapple to try to get the other guy's shoulders to the mat. And they realized like that, you know, if they started, um, you know, upping the showbiz style of it and, you know, just determining, you know, because fans would start to, you know, I mean, they would come out, but then they'd see a big drop in attendance as, you know, like if they featured it again. And, I, you know, some of the fans didn't want to sit outside in a big stadium under the sun for four hours. You know what I mean? It right. wasn't, they realized they needed to make it quicker and to do that, they had to decide, decide in advance who was going to be, who was going to win and who was going to lose. Right? Gotcha. So, and and that's, they just, they made a seismic shift that way. Um, and, you know, the stuff I grew up on, the, the rationale was, yes, you know who's going to win and lose before you go out there, but you figure out, you just kind of, get in the ring together and things flow. You're good enough or you've been there long enough that you can communicate with like looks or, you know, words in the ring and have it happen. The stuff when I got involved was much more, you know, it was completely planned out, you know, from in the backstage, you know, that, I mean, like for a 10 minute match, they spend an hour and a half going over each and every single move. So it's, right. you know, now it's much more, it's much faster now. To some people, it's much more exciting. It's lost a little bit of its magic to me because there there was a sense before, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't know what was going on. But, um, you know, there was a time that, you know, is, is, we're far gone from it now, where the whole goal was to make people hate the bad guys to the point where they would pay money, right? Because it was usually, it was a working class thing. Like, you know, you pay your money on Saturday to see the guy you hate, the loud mouth, the whoever he is, the bully, mm -hmm. get beat up by the guy you love, right? Right, right. And it, you could get people so, and I, I don't include myself because I came in generations after, but there was a magic to it. There was an art to it where you could get people so angry and so engaged that they would do things like up to and including stabbing you on your way to or <laughs> out of the ring. Like people in the 80s and the 70s were just so invested um, that they would they would slash the tires of the wrestlers. They would ch ch chase at the, you know chase them out of town. They would do you know it, it was just a whole other world. And it was you know you kind of had to be that guy. If you're a good guy, even if you're not really a nice person, if your character is you're a good guy, you got to stop and you got to sign every kid's 
you know, or right. 7-Eleven after the matches. You got to be nice to everybody. And if you're a bad guy, you got to treat them like you're a jerk, you know? And it's just an interesting, <laughs> and if somebody came up to you in a bar and said, I hear that wrestling fake, your job was to punch them in the face, right? Because, like, cause like <laughs> you know, the, 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 the word of mouth would spread, and they'd be like, well, the guy at the bar just beat up that wrestler. Why am I going to pay to see him fight? You know what I mean? Right, so right, right. It's just a whole wacky world. Now it's different, and I get it. Like, I, listen, I'm, I'm not advocating for stabbing people on the way to the ring, but I'm just saying that part, the mystique is gone. Right, so right. So my interest, my interest has waned quite, yeah. quite severely, yeah. It sounds like it was very punk rock back in the day. <laughs> It, to me, yeah, and some of the, honestly, I've been to some shows in the 90s, there was a company called ECW, which was which stood for Extreme Championship Wrestling, and it was so wild, like, I mean, so much of the stuff spilled out, outside of the ring, into the crowd, like, you really felt like you were part of it, it had like a cult-like following for a few years, and so I went to some of those shows in the States, I would drive you know, wherever I had to to get to see that stuff. And there was, that was just as thrilling or adrenaline producing as any punk rock stuff I've ever seen. So That's awesome, so. man. Yeah. That's so cool. Cool. Well, uh, Mike, we're coming towards the end, uh, the end of my questions here. Um, awesome. Last few ones are, um, h- how, do you, uh, how do you find new music? How do I find new music? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I, well, the music that I really like, that I really listen to a lot is reggae, and hip hop, right? Mm-hmm. So I mean, all yeah. I mean, my YouTube knows what I'm interested in at this point. They okay. read my mind and give me algorithms and you know or whatever. Right, so, right. I mean, you know, and uh, you know, and, and there are people that I follow and I'll look up and you know, so I'll find new rappers based on producers that I like and stuff like that, right? Okay. Um, and then the, I've been really lucky to play with some. You know, I, I play in another band as well. I play drums in another band, a Toronto band called Beast Music. And that band is like, you know, kind of half of us are about my age. The other half are in their early 20s. So the singer from that band, Francis, is always throwing me the new punk rock stuff that she's into. So I didn't know what Idols was. You know what I mean? Like oh, my God. British Idols is amazing. Idols. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly, and then she said, she said, one, she said you got to check them out. I was like, sure. One day she's like, did you check them out? Yeah, I was like, no. So I spent, I got sucked into like a three-hour evening of being like, what, what is this? Like, why, what is this that I've been missing? So, <laughs> yeah. you know, and then she sent me Sleaford Mods the other day. And, you know, so I get tons of cool new stuff. Uh, and luckily, because I get to work with and hang out with people who are, you know, uh, so hungry for all the newest stuff. So cool. kind of like that. And then my daughter's 20. She listens to like a million different things that I don't listen to. And, you know, one out of 10 things we are kind of on the same page on. So yeah, a few different sources. Wicked, wicked. What, uh, tell me uh, who's like the latest new rapper that you've come across that you're like, holy shit, this guy's amazing. Or this girl, or person. Uh, well, there's a rapper named Rhapsody. Um, and she's a, she's a female uh, MC. And she's kind of doing... Like she's just she's an amazing lyricist. She's like and she's got great producers. Like she's got a bunch of stuff produced by this producer named Ninth Wonder, who I love. Um, at the BET Awards this week, Public Enemy, em- Public Enemy, Public Enemy did an uh, updated version of "Fight the Power," and it had Nas rapping on it. It had Wicked. Um, yeah, and it had Rhapsody, right? So she's kind of like you know I love her. There's actually a Toronto-based. Um, she's kind of like, she sings and raps. Her name is Witch Prophet. Uh, okay. I think she's from Eritrea. Yeah, I know her. Ethiopia. Like, yeah, I love that. You yeah, know, I she's love wicked. That. And um, there's a song that came out. There's been a couple of great songs inspired by, like, today's rebellious times. There's a song called uh, Pig Feet by Denzel Curry and Daylit that I've listened to on repeat. Yes. Um, Anderson Pack has a song called Lockdown. Uh which I love as well. So there's, I don't know, there's a bunch of, like, there's tons of cool stuff out there. Cool, 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 cool. And um, my last uh, question here, let's have a look-see. Uh, oh, who, who, in your opinion, this could be, like, now or from from back in the day, uh, who's the most underrated artist or, or band, in your opinion? Um, uh, I don't know if she's underrated. I, I think she was from a mainstream perspective, um, maybe Nina Simone. Mm-hmm. I know Nina Simone, like the people who love Nina Simone, like myself and like, you know, May Lynn and Catherine, like, you know, oh, that's, that's a, that's an artist in bad breed that we kind of, a lot of us really gravitate to, um, because there's just, you know, and I don't know, like, I mean, are, are you a fan? Like, do you like, you know, oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. For okay. sure. So, I mean, you know, 
people, I think people who listen to music, you know, who are kind of into music, maybe, you know, not to sound like a jerk, but like there's, I think there are people who just know who Nina Simone is because she is ranked highly by musicians and like music fans, but she never had, like, she didn't have like a, a Diana Ross, like Ain't No Mountain High Enough. She didn't have a huge single that right. sort of everybody knew. Right. You know what I mean? And, you know, and she is inspirational. She is a beautiful piano player. She is an amazing interpreter of other people's songs. My mm -hmm. daughter, that's somebody who my daughter and I both love. And um, we were talking the other day, and we were just looking it up, and it's like she only wrote the lyrics to four of her songs, Mississippi Goddamn being one of them. Right. And all the rest, but she sings them like she wrote them from before the day she was born. Right, with you know that I mean? soul, like she right? She interprets songs better, in my opinion, than anybody that, that I've heard. So cool. I, I love her. And I also love, and I, again, not a huge mainstream, I'm going to name one more because sure, you know, you yeah. uh, Nick Cave. I yes. really, really like Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. Um, uh, they're very inspirational to me because they're about, a, I mean, I think they're more than a decade older than I am. However, they've never resorted to becoming a parody of themselves. They continually put out new music that's exciting and different from what they did before and live it's some of the best stuff i've seen so anyways cool that's what i would say awesome man great well mike that's uh that's it for me um all right thanks so much for taking the time man this is a great chat uh i mean we, oh, we talked for an hour much. so i really enjoyed it i really appreciate you listening to the record and i thank you very much for for speaking to me i appreciate it no problem man all right well all the best to you and uh really looking forward to being able to see the band live one day no, man, it'll happen. <laughs> All right, man. Have, Have a good a one. Have a great day, man. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye.